Welcome to the Chapter 12 Summary of the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Today we're exploring weather theory, one of the most important subjects for any pilot to master. And really, could there be anything more crucial to safe flying than understanding the environment we fly through? The atmosphere around us is a complex, dynamic system that directly influences every aspect of flight. From takeoff to landing, weather affects performance, fuel consumption, route planning, and ultimately, our safety in the air. Think about the last time you looked up at the sky before a flight. You were already practicing the most fundamental skill of aviation weather, observation. But observation without understanding is like having a map without knowing how to read it. That's why today, we're going to build the foundation of weather knowledge that every competent pilot needs. Weather isn't just something that happens around us. It's something we fly through, plan for, and sometimes avoid altogether. The consequences of misreading weather signs can range from an uncomfortable flight to a truly dangerous situation. The good news? With the right knowledge and resources, we can make informed decisions that keep us safe. Let's start by understanding what the atmosphere actually is. The atmosphere is essentially a blanket of air composed mainly of nitrogen and oxygen that surrounds our planet. If you could see it, it would look like an ocean with swirls, eddies, rising and falling air, and waves traveling great distances. This mixture of gases is in constant motion, creating the weather patterns we experience. In any given volume of air, nitrogen makes up about 78% of the atmosphere, while oxygen accounts for 21%. The remaining 1% consists of argon, carbon dioxide, and traces of other gases. Though it only makes up a tiny fraction of the atmosphere, water vapor, varying from zero to about 5% by volume, is responsible for major weather changes. The envelope of gases surrounding Earth changes as you move upward. Scientists have identified four distinct layers or spheres based on thermal characteristics, chemical composition, movement, and density. The first layer, which is where virtually all weather occurs, is the troposphere. It extends from about 6 to 20 kilometers, 4 to 12 miles, over the poles and up to 48,000 feet over the equatorial regions. Inside the troposphere, the average temperature decreases at a rate of about 2 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 feet of altitude gain. Meanwhile, pressure decreases at roughly 1 inch of mercury per 1,000 feet of altitude gain. At the top of the troposphere is the tropopause, which essentially traps moisture and associated weather in the troposphere. This boundary is important for pilots because it's commonly associated with the jet stream and possible clear air turbulence. Above the tropopause are three more layers, the stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. But these have little influence on the weather we encounter during flight. Now, let's talk about what actually drives weather. Atmospheric circulation. The atmosphere is constantly in motion due to the uneven heating of Earth's surface. When air is heated, it expands, becomes less dense, and rises. As it rises, it cools, becomes denser, and eventually sinks back toward the surface. Because the Earth has a curved surface that rotates on a tilted axis while orbiting the Sun, equatorial regions receive more heat than polar regions. This temperature difference creates a circulation pattern as warm air rises at the equator and cooler air sinks at the poles. But this simple pattern is complicated by the Coriolis force, a deflection caused by the rotation of the Earth. In the Northern Hemisphere, this force deflects moving air to the right of its path. The Coriolis force causes the general circulation to break up into three distinct cells in each hemisphere, creating the prevailing winds we rely on as pilots. Let's talk about a fundamental factor in weather, atmospheric pressure. The unequal heating of Earth's surface affects air density and creates pressure differences. These pressure differences drive air movement, which we experience as wind. Air pressure is critical to aviation because it affects aircraft performance, especially takeoff, rate of climb, and landing. At higher altitudes with decreased atmospheric pressure, aircraft engines and propellers become less efficient. This leads to reduced rates of climb and requires a longer ground run for takeoff. The standard measurement for atmospheric pressure at sea level is 29.92 inches of mercury, or 1,013.2 millibars. 
As pilots, we're constantly monitoring barometric pressure because even small changes can significantly impact our altimeter readings. You've probably heard the term high pressure or low pressure in weather reports. Areas of high pressure generally bring clear, stable conditions, usually good news for flying. Conversely, low pressure areas typically bring clouds, precipitation, and potentially challenging flying conditions. By tracking barometric pressure trends, we can predict weather movements. Rising pressure generally indicates approaching fair weather, while decreasing or rapidly falling pressure suggests approaching bad weather and possibly severe storms. As altitude increases, atmospheric pressure decreases, on average one inch of mercury for every 1,000 feet. This decrease in pressure makes the air less dense or thinner, affecting both aircraft and human performance. At higher altitudes, decreased oxygen pressure can impair your mental functions and physical capabilities, something we need to be extremely mindful of, especially in unpressurized aircraft. Now let's talk about wind and currents, which are simply the horizontal and vertical movements of air. They're important because they affect every aspect of flight from takeoff to landing and cruise operations. Wind is created by the combination of atmospheric pressure differences, the Coriolis force, friction, and temperature variations of the air. In the northern hemisphere, wind flows clockwise around areas of high pressure, anticyclonic circulation, and counterclockwise around areas of low pressure, cyclonic circulation. Understanding these patterns can be incredibly useful for flight planning. For example, when flying from west to east, you might encounter favorable tailwinds on the northern side of a high-pressure system or the southern side of a low-pressure system. While large-scale wind patterns are predictable, local conditions can create their own challenges. Convective currents, small areas of local circulation, cause the bumpy, turbulent air we often experience when flying at lower altitudes during warmer weather. These currents form when the sun heats different surfaces at different rates. Pavement might create updrafts while bodies of water often create downdrafts. Obstructions on the ground can also disrupt wind flow, creating potentially hazardous turbulence, especially during takeoff and landing. This is particularly true in mountainous regions, where the wind following the contour of terrain can create severe downdrafts on the leeward side of mountains. One of the most dangerous weather phenomena pilots face is wind shear, a sudden change in wind speed or direction over a very small area. Wind shear can occur at any altitude, but low-level wind shear is especially hazardous because of the proximity to the ground. The most severe type, a microburst, can produce downdrafts exceeding 6,000 feet per minute and wind direction changes that seriously degrade aircraft performance. Now let's look at how wind and pressure are represented on weather maps, which are essential tools for pre-flight planning. On surface weather charts, isobars, Lines connecting points of equal pressure reveal the pressure gradient. Closely spaced isobars indicate a steep pressure gradient and strong winds, while widely spaced isobars suggest lighter winds. Wind conditions are depicted by arrows attached to station location circles with barbs or pennants indicating wind speed. Each full barb represents 10 knots. Each half barb equals five knots, and a pennant signifies 50 knots. Understanding the stability of the atmosphere is crucial for predicting weather conditions. Atmospheric stability refers to the atmosphere's resistance to vertical motion. A stable atmosphere makes vertical movement difficult, while an unstable atmosphere allows small vertical air movements to grow larger, potentially developing into turbulence and storms. The rate at which temperature decreases with increasing altitude is called the lapse rate. The standard atmospheric lapse rate is about 2 degrees Celsius, 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit, per 1,000 feet. When air rises, it expands and cools adiabatically, meaning the temperature change occurs without heat transfer to or from the surrounding air. The dry adiabatic lapse rate for unsaturated air is about 3 degrees Celsius, 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit, per 1,000 feet while the moist adiabatic lapse rate varies from 1.1 degrees Celsius to 2.8 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Fahrenheit to 5 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet. The combination of moisture and temperature determines air stability and resulting weather. Cool, dry air tends to be very stable, leading to good flying conditions. The greatest instability occurs in warm, moist air, which is why we see daily thunderstorms in tropical regions during summer. 
An important atmospheric anomaly is the temperature inversion, a layer where temperature increases with altitude rather than decreases. Inversion layers often trap weather and pollutants below, potentially causing poor visibility, fog, haze, or smoke. Now let's delve into moisture and its critical role in weather. The atmosphere naturally contains water vapor, and the amount it can hold depends on temperature. For every 20 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature, the air's moisture holding capacity roughly doubles. Relative humidity refers to the actual amount of moisture in the air compared to the total amount it could hold at that temperature. When air reaches its moisture holding capacity, 100% relative humidity, condensation occurs, forming clouds, fog, or precipitation. The temperature at which air can hold no more moisture is called the dew point. When air temperature equals dew point temperature, the air is saturated. This relationship helps pilots predict cloud formation. As air rises and cools, clouds typically form at the altitude where temperature and dew point converge. There are four main ways air can reach saturation. Warm air moving over a cold surface, cold and warm air mixing, air cooling at night through contact with the cooler ground, or air being forced upward in the atmosphere. When temperatures are above freezing, moisture often condenses as dew. Below freezing, it forms frost, which poses a definite flight safety hazard by disrupting airflow over the wing and reducing lift production while increasing drag. Fog, essentially a cloud on the surface, forms when air temperature near the ground cools to the dew point. Different types include radiation fog, forms on clear, calm nights in low-lying areas, advection fog, when warm, moist air moves over a cold surface, upslope fog, when moist air is forced up sloping terrain, and steam fog, when cold air moves over warm water. Clouds are visible indicators of moisture in the atmosphere and often signal future weather. They form when invisible water vapor condenses or sublimates onto tiny particles called condensation nuclei. Clouds are classified by their height and appearance. Low clouds below 6,500 feet include stratus, stratocumulus, and nimbostratus. Middle clouds, 6,500 to 20,000 feet, include altostratus and altocumulus. High clouds, above 20,000 feet, include cirrus, cirrostratus, and cirrocumulus. Then there are clouds with vertical development, like cumulus and cumulonimbus, which can extend from low levels to well above 40,000 feet. For pilots, the most dangerous cloud type is the cumulonimbus, or thunderstorm cloud. These massive vertical formations create extreme turbulence, with updrafts and downdrafts potentially exceeding 3,000 feet per minute. They can also produce large hailstones, damaging lightning, tornadoes, and heavy precipitation. Understanding precipitation is equally important. Precipitation occurs when water or ice particles in clouds grow large enough that the atmosphere can no longer support them. It can fall as drizzle, rain, ice pellets, hail, snow, or ice, all of which can dramatically affect flight conditions and aircraft performance. Air masses are large bodies of air that take on the characteristics of the regions where they originate. They're classified as polar or tropical based on temperature and maritime or continental based on moisture content. When different air masses meet, they form boundaries called fronts. Fronts are critical to understand because they always signal impending weather changes. There are four main types, warm fronts, warm air advancing over cooler air, cold fronts, cold air advancing under warmer air, stationary fronts, where neither air mass is moving, and occluded fronts, where a cold front overtakes a warm front. Each type of front brings distinctive weather patterns. Warm fronts typically bring gradually deteriorating conditions with stratus clouds and steady precipitation. Cold fronts, which move faster than warm fronts, often bring sudden storms, gusty winds, and rapidly changing conditions. Understanding these patterns allows pilots to anticipate conditions they might encounter during flight. Thunderstorms deserve special attention due to their extreme hazards. They develop in three stages. The cumulus stage, characterized by updrafts, the mature stage, with both updrafts and downdrafts, and the dissipating stage, when downdrafts predominate. The hazards associated with thunderstorms include violent turbulence, tornadoes, icing, large hail, zero visibility, wind shear, 
altimeter errors, lightning, and potential engine flameout due to water ingestion. A single thunderstorm can contain all these hazards, making them extremely dangerous to aviation. The best strategy for dealing with thunderstorms? Avoidance. It's recommended to circumnavigate severe thunderstorms by at least 20 nautical miles, as hazards like hail can extend well beyond the visible cloud. If you can't fly around a thunderstorm, the safest option is to delay your flight until it passes. This is a pivotal moment in our discussion. As pilots, we need to understand that weather knowledge isn't just academic, it's practical, essential, and potentially life-saving. We're not merely passengers in the atmosphere. We're active participants who need to make informed decisions based on the weather we observe and the forecasts we receive. Remember that time I mentioned thunderstorms can produce updrafts and downdrafts exceeding 3,000 feet per minute? That's more vertical speed than many light aircraft can counter. This isn't meant to frighten you, but to emphasize why understanding weather isn't optional, it's fundamental to safe flight operations. As we've explored the atmosphere, circulation patterns, pressure systems, winds, moisture, clouds, and fronts, I hope you've gained a deeper appreciation for the complex interplay of forces that create the weather we experience. But knowledge without application lacks value. So how do we use this information? Before every flight, get a complete weather briefing from flight service or other approved sources. Learn to analyze weather charts, radar images, satellite pictures, and aviation weather reports. Develop the skill to correlate what you see outside your window with what meteorologists predict. And most importantly, establish personal minimums based on your experience and capabilities, then stick to them. The atmosphere is a fluid, constantly changing environment. By understanding basic weather theory, you're equipped to interpret reports and forecasts, recognize potentially hazardous conditions, and make sound decisions that keep you and your passengers safe. Aviation weather services provide valuable information, but the final decision to fly always rests with you, the pilot in command. Use the knowledge we've discussed today to make those decisions wisely. Thank you for joining me for this exploration of weather theory. Like the atmosphere itself, there's always more to learn and discover about weather. I encourage you to continue building on the foundation we've established. Understanding the weather isn't just about becoming a better pilot, it's about becoming a safer one. If you found this information valuable, please subscribe to our channel for more aviation knowledge. Until next time, keep your eyes on the skies and your mind on the weather. Blue skies and tailwinds.